off we go. Uh, we were working uh, the other day on this, this, well, it's not a new idea, but it's a more developed idea. We had torque in uh, physics one, but almost every single force we were using there was perpendicular. So we just did the force times the distance to calculate the torque. Now we've changed it to moment. Uh, God only knows why, but we have. It, it's the, te the tendency in uh, physics is to use torque with either the symbol tau or even the symbol gamma. Remember that's tau, or gamma is not uncommon for torque. But in engineering, we tend to do moment. The word doesn't necessarily make as much sense, but at least the letter does, so we're halfway there. Uh, we were calculating this moment, but we were getting to the point where we can now do it for any vector, any force vector in 3D space, any place relative to whatever our point of interest is. Maybe generically call it point O. Some moment is always calculated with respect to some particular point. The moment about some other point with the very same force could be very, very different. Well, that's, that's why uh, when you have the same force acting on an object, the object might fail one place but not somewhere else. It's because the moment was greater there, and so it failed there. The moment was less somewhere else. We'll see that as we go along here, and we'll definitely see that in uh, in 209 coming up in the spring of strength materials. So uh, we're talking in a moment now in any 3D space. That's where we got to on Monday. Remember what it looks like? Moment equals the moment as a vector. The, the, the mathematical calculation you need to do that will result in a vector, which moment is. Remember what it was? Chris. Chris didn't remember, but he knows where to look for it. No, he doesn't. Here somewhere. It's R cross R. It's R. We'll make sure we remember what that is. Cross the mathematical. That's not times. That's the cross product. So don't anymore else ever in your career use X for times. If you need to, use a dot or use parentheses, put them together, or, but don't use X anymore because it means something very, very different to us now. This cross product of uh, uh, R with F. So we've got some point O. For some reason, we want to find the moment about that point. The, by, by for some reason, I mean, in the problem, they literally specifically ask that. Say, what's the moment about point A? Or, uh, you may need to look at it. If you remember when we were calculating torque back in Physics 1, uh, a lot of times it was around one of the supports. We were looking, we had a problem with two bridges, I mean a bridge with two supports and a train going across. And you could pick either support to figure out what the torque of the train was about that. Remember that, that problem from the, a couple of years ago? Uh, so sometimes this point is not specified by the problem, uh, not specified in the wording, but it's specified just in what you need to choose to get the, get the to solve the problem. And it's going to turn out that uh, that's not terribly crucial as long as you do everything else right. When we get a little bit farther, you'll see whatever you pick for all the, the point of interest, it, things will work out. Just don't screw up what you do with that once you've chosen it. So there's some point O and some force F in some direction. And this doesn't, it doesn't matter if this is 3D space or not. I can't draw in 3D space, so I'll draw in 2D space. But it works just the same in uh, 2D as it does in 3D. It's just a little simpler in 3D. What is, so there's the, the force F. And we'll need some vector representation of f. And for x, y, it's usually pretty easy. If we know the magnitude and the angle, we get the trig components. Uh, what's that r? Zero. It helps locate f, but how? F's this big, long vector. Here's o. Uh, I got
going to relate O to F somehow because it depends on where F is and how much moment it exerts. You knew that from physics one anyway. So that was the moment arm. This represent this tells us, this leads us to the moment arm. So we have to draw R0 properly, get the right vector in there, or it's not going to work. The cross products are going to screw up and not give us the right moment. So how do we do the vector R0? We've got to be able to draw it, then we've got to be able to represent it in vector form so we can put it in the cross product and do it. BJ? It's the perpendicular line. Shortest distance was perpendicular to the action of the force. That's the vector R0? Yes. Uh, sort of. Which direction to go first? Let's do that. Because a vector could go either from point O to F or from F to point O. Which is it? Because it's very different. Uh, you get a well, vector pointing one way, and if you get exactly the same vector but it points the other way, they're negatives of each other, and you're going to get a completely different cross product. Because uh, these are vectors, this results in a vector, and the direction of all of those, as well as the magnitude of all of those, are very much interdependent. So first, does R0, the vector that locates F and O with respect to each other, does it go from O to F or from F to O? O to F. O to F. Every time. It goes from O out. Now, then, uh, that's, that's set. No argument there. We're not going to negotiate that. Some of you might try something else, but it ain't going to work. Now the question is, all right, if it goes from O to F, where does it go to on F? Does it go down here to the tail? Does it go up there to the head? Does it go to just somewhere? Where does it go? Here's the cool thing. And this can be very, very, very useful to you doing problems because this will make things a lot easier. What BJ said was, uh, it goes to the the shortest distance, the perpendicular line between F and the point, which would be maybe something like some a vector do something like that. The trouble is to come up with a vector that goes from O to F in that direction. It might be difficult to come up with in a problem because uh, if if uh, if we don't know that angle and we don't know that distance, uh, if we don't know that point, wherever that happens to be, maybe it's on F, maybe it isn't. That could be hard to come up with R. This will work, but it may just be hard to come up with R. There might be an easier <coughs> point to come up with R, and wouldn't it be swell if we could use that? For example, this point right here, well, if we went along the x direction, right in the horizontal direction, and hit right there, maybe that one's easier, whatever the problem says. Or maybe the problem is such that if we went off at 45 degrees, we happen to hit. Remember what that was called? Line of, line of action. Remember, force is a sliding vector. Go anywhere along its line of action, that won't change its direction, its magnitude, or its units, and that's fine. So maybe the geometry of the problem is such that that's a real easy point to find. Real easy. We have 45 degrees, and we know maybe from the problem where that is, we got R. That's the cool thing about R0. It's from O to anywhere along the line of action of the force. Anywhere. You don't even have to pick the same one. Maybe you like that point because the geometry is just easier to your eye. Maybe this point's easier to you. Maybe you like the perpendicular and we're willing to do the work to find that. 
doesn't matter. Any R0, as long as you go from the point to the line of action of the force, you will calculate the right moment. Because when you calculate the cross product, yeah, the R0 is different for all of those, but when you do the cross product, it all comes out to be that the magnitude is F times D. It all comes out that way. It's a little difficult to show because I've got to go through a bunch of cross products, but you can try it. You can, you can set up a problem with a couple different points on the line of action. You can set up a real easy one to go through. You could show yourself that. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll have some examples where we'll say, what R0 should we use? And we might not agree. You might have one you like and you have one you like, and we'll get the same answer anyway. So that makes this very easy. Any vector R to the line of action. Doesn't have to be to the force itself. Remember, just where we put the, if we have the force pushing or pulling, it looks different, but it's the same force, the same action, so that can't matter anywhere along the line of action. Man, oh man, that makes things easy. So I'll just draw it generically somewhere. And then when we get to problems, you know, most of the problems are pretty regular. There's lots of uh, uh, 15, 30, 45 degree angles in our problems, thank God. Because life is exactly like that way. It's nothing but nice big fat angles for us to work with. So, uh, uh, we'll, anything works. All right, so um, I gave you the recipe for doing this. Maybe some of you went and looked a little bit online for other ways to look at it, but uh, whatever works for you. There's, there's uh, remember it's about laying out the three by three matrix with I, J, and K, and then somebody has the solution method. Uh, take I and J and repeat them, and then you do this slashing thing. That I always get confused, but you might like that. Maybe that's what you already learned. Uh, another one I saw said list the components and forget the top and bottom, and then do this argyle-like thing through them, and I, that got me all screwed up too. So my little brain does very well with that. Do the cross multiplication, just make sure there's a minus on the J and a plus on the I and K. Do everything in the same order, you're fine. Whatever works for you. In fact, uh, I think there's a, a, a program you can get for your calculators. So you just type in the three components, of the two vectors, or even yeah, three vectors. We, we only have two vectors here. Three components of the two vectors, and it'll calculate the cross product for you. Uh, if that's what you use, that's fine. Just be careful. You come into a calc you, you come into a test. Your calculator has dead batteries. You've got to borrow mine. It's not on there. All right. So let's do a problem here. Let's actually do this. Problem. So imagine we have maybe a shelf bracket or something, some kind of bracket on a wall. The bracket looks something like that, just a nice right angle bracket of some kind. And there's a force on that bracket out here at this point. And that force comes off of, uh, at 40 degrees from the horizontal. It has a magnitude of 760 pounds. And we have this uh, bracket embedded in the wall or in the ceiling there. And we sure as hell don't want it to break out. So we have to design the attachment with the ceiling such that this force doesn't rip the, the, the bracket out of the ceiling. So partly it's going to be pulling it that way and pulling it up, so that could be a worry. But there's also the worry that this force is also going to try to twist this bracket around that point. So there makes good sense for our point O. We want to find out how much moment 
this force exerts about that point. Because if this thing's going to fail, that's where it's likely to fail. Because just glancing at it, that's the one point that's farthest away from this force. So the moment increases with distance, things are going to be worse there than anywhere else in the bracket. As a designer, you might need to look at the, how much twisting in this bracket is going on anywhere. You certainly have to look here, back here. You've got to make sure that's welded well enough. Enough metal there, because it could fail there even if that's strong enough. We'll talk about that stuff in 209 next term. But for now, we're, we're going to do okay with this. So let's put some dimensions on this. This is 12 inches. And this is 10 inches. And we want to find how much moment that force is exerting about point O. Oh, I label it point O. All right, so we want to find the moment about point O of R O cross F. Uh, where is the vector R O? F, that's not a whole lot of trouble. We got the magnitude and the direct angle, so we can figure out the components, uh, whatever we need of that. What's the vector RO? Whatever you want it to be. Uh, might be pretty darn easy to go right down to that point, because we know just where that point is. But maybe you'd rather find that point. Maybe that just works better for your eye. Doesn't matter. You're going to get the same thing. In fact, take 10 minutes uh, after class or the next couple of days or something and prove that to yourself. You get the very same moment as long as you do it right. But it might make sense to pick that as RO. Because remember, this is a, a geometry dependent vector. It's a position vector, and so if we can link it to geometry you already know, no sweat. Things are just a little bit easier. So, we want to calculate the moment. We need these two vectors. You figure them out in I, J, K space. And we'll pick the usual. We're not going to be terribly creative with that. We'll pick X is horizontal to the right, Y is uh, vertical to the top. And so you write down both those vectors. No sense going to the cross product unless we make sure we got those vectors right. You get those vectors wrong, the cross product's not coming out right. I don't care what you do. Well, I guess you could screw it up and it comes out right. Screw two things up and they cancel each other. That's lucky. I would hate to base my career on that. All right, so everybody got the picture. We've got a force in there. We've got to come up with a vector that represents it. We've got an RO vector. If you want to do a different one, that's fine. You just got to get the geometry right. But that one makes sense. Uh, RO is a uh, geometry dependent vector. So let's just link it to uh, uh, geometry we already have, not figure out anything new. But some of you aren't happy unless things are as difficult as possible. So once we get that going, we'll need some space a little over here. Actually, calculate that moment. Remember, it's a three by three matrix. So let's set that up. Do the cross product. Make sure we got it right. All right. So figure out R, O, and F. Might be a good chance 
time when you've done that to check with somebody else, see if they got the same one, so we're all doing the same problem, or to get the same result if we're doing this different problem. your units. They're just as much a part of this as anything else is. So uh, 10 in the x direction, minus 12 in the j direction. That's see, that that just came right off the drawing. That's why that O uh, R O is so easy. You can pick the other one up at the top there, but you got more work to do, which means more chance of an error. This one was uh, right off the picture. All right, let's see. How about F? It would be nice if we could do it to in the x, y components, put it right into our vector. Remember, when I break it into components, I get rid of the original vector. I sure don't want all three on there. It's a different problem. Alan, what did you get for Fx? Just the number? Uh, yeah. For the x component, it's 582.2. And you dispute? It's 760 pounds by the cosine of 40 degrees. So whatever comes out in the calculator. It's 582. We'll leave it at that. That's good enough. And yeah, that's positive, so we're OK. Fiona, what did you get for the y one? 488.5. 488.5. Call 489. Positive? Yes. Yeah, it's a 489J. And that's pounds. So now we can set up the rest of the matrix. Uh, I, the R0 is 10 minus 12 and 0. We have a two dimensional problem here. And that's in inches. Remember, we're multiplying all of, as we step through all of this, we're multiplying some part of the second row times some part of the first row, and those numbers always carry units, and the numbers have the units have to always work out right. So don't forget the units on these. No sense converting computing converting to feet. We got everything in inches, let's just leave it there. And then the f vector. 582, 489, no negatives there. Again, it's a two-dimensional problem, so it's also a zero, and its units are pounds.
And so now we can work out the cross product. Okay, so give that a try. Then we'll run through it real quick, see if we all get the same thing. Do the cross product recipe carefully. You mess up one little component, one little minus sign, and the whole thing's ruined. Don't come crying to me saying I had everything else okay. All I mixed up with one little, one little component, one little minus sign. That's not bad, is it? Yeah. As if your family's driving over that bridge. Yeah, Trevor, you're already there. Not you, Trevor. Other Trevor. What are we going to do about that? Did you know that? His name's Trevor, too. What am I going to do? How big do you think my brain is? One and only one Fiona. One and only one Alan. The two Trevor. Thanks, Huh? Oh, yeah. I'm not even Catholic. Actually, I do have a two-year-old little boy. Two years. Really smarter. So, in 16 years, when he's 18, ready to start college, I'll be ready to give up. <laughs> so I. <laughs> if I'm still here in 16 years, Stop by, shoot me, <laughs> put me out of my misery. Be around. Same, same drawings, same jokes. And now the little Alan will be there, driving me nuts. Got something? Did you guys agree? Well, I, oh, you I agreed, but I you did. Myself. You didn't even agree on whether you agree. <laughs> All right, let's let's go. Let's do it. Let's step through this. Let's step through this. Let's see if you if you uh, forget it or did it or something. Let's check it. First thing we're going to do is the eye component. Doesn't have to be, but that just makes sense. Start with the eye. Keep them in order. Less chance of a mistake. Remember what you do with the eye. How you figure out the eye component? Ignore the I row and the I column. That leaves just four little things. And you do the cross multiplication of those. Same order. Down, minus, up, product. But there's a zero in each one. So we have no I component. So that's the, we do that multiplication minus that multiplication. So that's the I component. Now we'll do the J component. Oops, it's always a minus, because then we can do the same order. Minus J hat. Take out the J row, take out the J column, and multiply in the same direction that we had there. So we take out that one. We've got these four. So we multiply, oops, a zero. Oops, is zero. Be that times that minus that times that. Always the same order. This is also a zero. That's always true for a two-dimensional problem in x y space. If you if you call your two d's x and y, that's what it's going to be. But I I caution you. Don't just jump to that. Double check it. 
because if it doesn't actually come out that way, you miss something up here. You got one of those in the wrong order, and then what comes next is going to be screwed up just as much. So don't just assume this unless you're in a huge hurry. Take the two seconds to double check it that it actually comes out to be zero. It gives you some confidence that what comes next works. All right, K component. Take out the K row, take out the K column. We're left with just these four, and we do that product minus that product, always in the same order. So 10 times 489. Minus, oh, let's see. Units on 10 inches, units on 49 pounds, inch pounds. Very typical for units of uh, torque or moment. Inch pounds, or foot pounds, or newton meters, all of those are very common. What are, what are the bicycle tools now that all have, all have torque wrenches built into them now that part to? What are the units? units I think are newton meters, right? And it's stamped right on them, right there. And so you're tightening a bolt on your bicycle, and it has to be tightened to a torque of like four newton meters. You get the wrench that says four newton meters on it. Stick it in there, turn it, and when that amount of torque's been applied, it starts slipping, and it won't put any more torque on. So you don't over tighten a bolt, a bolt anymore. How many bicycles are out there where somebody over tightened the bolt and snapped it off? Doesn't happen anymore. Uh, of course, now I got to buy those tools. Thank you very much. But okay, so minus the other direction. Uh, oh, there's a minus sign in there. Don't lose that one. That's a second minus sign. This is from the arithmetic. That's from the problem. You need them both. Uh, 582. And the units are all the same, inch pounds, inch pounds, inch pounds, or pound inches, doesn't matter which, that doesn't matter. And so what's that number come out to be? 10 times that plus 12 times that? 11,871. 12,000. <laughs> 12,000. 12,000 inch pounds. Remember, on this stuff, you don't design right to that anyway. You're going to put in a big fat factor of a multiple of two or something. So if we were designing this, we might knock that down to 6,000 as a factor of two just to be safe. So we, 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 uh, uh, we expect there, we know it could take 12,000, but we'll only load it to 6,000. Or we know it's going to have 12,000, we'll design it for 24. Either way, something like that, if that's the factor of two. Oh, something's missing. The K yeah, because this is a vector. It's got magnitude, units, and direction. All 2D problems, the moment should only come out in the K direction. That's all that's left. Um, it's positive. What's that mean to us? With that as our xy space, what does positive mean? Huh? Counterclockwise. For xy like that, counterclockwise is always positive. And that's what the picture looks like. You can see this force is going to try to rotate that bracket counterclockwise. And uh, x cross y. There's our positive direction for K. That's also right-hand rule. Or X, X, Y, thumbs out, or whichever one you like. But it all agrees. Tends to be a counterclockwise one. So if I ask, if I give you a 2D problem and say, find for me, please, the moment, I need the magnitude, the units, and the direction. You can do this, magnitude, units, direction. You can do this, magnitude, units, and direction. You can do uh, 
Five. Inch, pounds, pound, inch, it doesn't matter. Uh, counter, clockwise. Any one of those will be okay. I've got all three parts of the vector I need. For two-dimensional problems, it'll be that easy. For three-dimensional problems, we won't have those two zeros. We won't have those two zeros. Well, we might, but we, we won't definitely. For two-dimensional problems, laid out the same general way, we'll always get those same zeros. Anybody get something different? Bill, you okay with that? Yeah. You got to that? Alan, okay. Trevor... You want to be Trevor 1 or 2? A or B? One. Trevor or Trevorette? <laughs> Trev or Trevi? Or you have a nickname? Or you Trevor must have a, some nickname down at the shop. Oh, he's got several nicknames. Yeah, well, give, me, give, me, give us one. We'll use that. Uh, we call him Trevor Soros Rex. We're all right. Trevor Soros Rex? Why, is he a monster? No, or he's great squeal like a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it's easy to draft. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. All right, Trevor Rex. You can be just Trevor Raptor. <laughs> just so you don't feel inferior, and we'll still have a great battle between the two of you. That'll be awesome. <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, oh. Uh, two things that goes with these vector business, the, these moment vectors we're calculating. One is that. Any moment vector that we calculate, whatever moment vector we calculate, no, so let's do let's do this. Uh, let's make it this way. Any force that we have in a problem that causes a moment. So maybe I'll draw this. We have a force in a problem like there. It causes some moment like there, we can replace that force with an equivalent system that has both in it. That, that we actually will see. Uh, it would be easier when you see the picture. Uh, so this whole thing can become a, an equivalent system with both actually in the picture. Let's see what that means. It's easier to show than it is to say. Sometimes nothing's easy to say. All right, so we, let's, we'll use that very same setup we have. Simplified a little bit. Uh, we have this set up there. We have a system with only a force acting on it. An equivalent system. By that I mean all the physics is the same. We don't want the physics to change just because we're taking a little bit different viewpoint. Uh, and by the physics I mean that's going to tell us what's going to break and what isn't when we get to it next term, we're going to be able to figure out all the same stuff. An equivalent system, well, we don't want the object itself to change. We can change this into an equivalent system that has both a force and a moment in it. Uh, that's the point O. So I have to have the same force in it, otherwise it's not going to experience the same physics. And we knew the moment went that way. Those two systems are equivalent. Now, sometimes that will be very useful to us. Sometimes it won't. Uh, it also works both directions. So if we have a force and a moment, we can change the system into just a force. We're going to have a problem where we do exactly that. Because uh, the system with a moment in it is not going to make any sense because the problem we're going to have only has forces in it. We're, we're going to have objects 
in the problem that can only exert forces uh, as they act, but if we put them in the right place, they'll also give us the moment we need in the problem. This is called Vergnon's serum. Some French guy, I think he was in the class before this. Uh, uh, we can do this equivalency when we need it, and we'll have a problem coming up here. Um, another one, uh, another theorem we'll need a lot, and it's very usually, it's very straightforward, it's not going to be a big surprise. In fact, we hit it a little bit in physics form. Uh, well, we have this business. If we've got an object, with a bunch of forces acting on it, doing whatever it is forces do. We know that we can add up all of those forces and replace them with a single equivalent resultant force and we've got the same problem. So we know that we can do that. In this class, that sum is going to be zero because we don't want our things to accelerate. But in the real world, real world, some things do accelerate. Sometimes we want them to accelerate. We know that. So uh, that's no big surprise. We we were using that on the first day. Nobody ever raised their hand and said, "Where does that come from?" Because you've seen it before. That's nothing new, and it kind of makes sense anyway. We're going to do that. We've already done that a lot. But now we take some problem. And by whatever means, that problem has a bunch of moments in it. Maybe there's a moment there, and a moment over here, and one over here, doing whatever they do. And maybe those are caused excuse me, by forces. And you, you have one force, and you figure out the moment it causes, and you take another force, and the moment it causes, and yeah. We still can get the total moment by just adding up all the baby moments. And then we could replace all those multiple moments we've got with a single moment and simplify the problem. What we could do, we have a problem with lots of forces. And those forces are in all kinds of different places. So those forces are causing all kinds of different moments. We could total up all the forces, total up all the moments, reduce this very complicated picture to this. This is much simpler. Uh, that could be useful to us. In fact, we'll, we'll have a problem here. We can get started on it today. We can't, can't finish it, so we'll work on it some more um, on, uh, on Friday, and then I'll even let you finish the last part and turn it in for extra credit if you want. If you want to be my favorite student, you would do that. Alright, makes sense? So we're going to put those two things together. Lots of forces. They all cause lots of moments because the forces are all over the place. We can reduce them down to one single simple little picture. One moment, one force. We could even back out of that and get rid of the moment too. Go back to this big complicated problem, we reduce it to one force. And that's what we're going to do now. And I, I have a drawing of this for you, so you don't have to worry about sketching it out. Let's see if this works. And I was doing this over the weekend uh, up at my estate on Lake George. So this is a real life problem. There we go, there it is. Um, I, I brought my new cruise ship, cruise luxury liner up to, to Lake George. Uh, I, the wide part, because we found out if I try to turn the boat in the narrow part, it scrapes against both shores, it's that big. So I had to take it up to the wide part. And, and uh, I had some tugs to help me turn the thing. So I had four tugboats, each exerts 5,000 pounds. By the way, if you're looking for a summer job, I can always use a tugboat captain if you've got that kind of experience. Uh, so I put the four tugboats, one at 60 degrees, one 53, and I put that one there. There's the 90 feet back, 50 feet up. I put number three, I put that way. Uh, 
from some point. Well, you can figure out how far. And I had another tugboat down here. So there's four tugboats pushing this boat around. Each of those exerts not just a force, but a moment on it. So I want to figure out the total moment and the total force about point O. For whatever reason, maybe my cabin's right there. My, my, my bed is right there. And everything rotates around me. So uh, we've got this nasty picture. We want to reduce it to this picture, which is much easier. What's the total force on the boat? Because all those tugboats are going to cause the boat to slip sideways somewhere. I want to know where it's going next. But since they're all over the place, they're also going to tend to turn that boat. And I want to know how much that they're going to turn that boat. And so I want you to figure out that. Here's four forces in four different places. Figure out what the total single force would be, the total equivalent moment would be. And then what you can do, and this is where the extra credit part lives, once you've done all that, you've got the right force and the right moment. Imagine I had a tugboat, a single super tug, that could push with that force. Where would I put that tugboat? I got this big tugboat that could come in and push with the exact same force of all of those. Same direction, same magnitude. And you're going to have to figure out what that is. Because I don't know what it is. I got forced little boats. But I got to put that big tugboat somewhere so that it causes the same a moment that these four little boats. If the four little boats tends to make it spin clockwise with a certain moment, I want the big tugboat to do exactly that same thing. You gotta figure out where. And that's a little bit tougher step. That's why you get some time to take it home and work on that one. But that's the problem. So your first plan of action is just figure out what the total force is Figure out what the total moment is about point O. That's your first step. Okay? Makes sense? And then, if you get it right, you get to come up, spend the weekend with me and my family on the boat. You, you get the, the presidential suite, because I, I live in the king suite. Got enough. One's coming back to you, Chris. Don't you worry. I would never leave you out. All right. Any questions of what to do? You know how much each tug can push with. You know the direction. So there's the force exerted by each tug. You can figure out the total force on the, uh, we like to call it a boat, but it's really a ship. Uh, open bar for those of you over 21, you bet. Is that is that everybody? Anybody not over 21 yet? You? Oh, a couple little bit. All right. Well, oh, you? Okay. Well, you you guys you guys can serve the rest of us because it's not going to be too long with an open bar on a boat before we need some help. So that's your job. Right here. You, you you and but uh, uh, you can also say I'm sorry. You know, I'm going to have to cut you off. You, you have the you have the right to yeah you've got that okay so work on that a little bit get started make sure you got all your questions answered for me uh, and then we'll we'll take it up again uh, work on it a little bit on uh, on Friday as well make sense everybody. The, at least the first part. Find out the total force on the boat. Find out the total moment on the boat. And all you do is figure them out individually and then add them up. Get each of the forces, each of the tugboats. They're all numbered there to make things simple. They have different names, you know, like the uh, Queen of the Isle of Man and, and, uh, and, uh, Diablo's Revenge. 
Yeah. And that's you know, stuff like, I don't know where boat names come from. T-H-E boat. Huh? T-H-E boat. T-H-E boat. That's a good one. I hadn't thought of that one. Is that your my, boat? It's the name of my mom's boat growing up. Your, the boat's growing up? How do you do that? Because this, this boat started big. Didn't grow, we didn't have a little boat. Yeah, water. That water, water. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty neat, a boat that grows up. Cool. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe your mom and uh, my boat here should uh, have a little, uh, uh, play a little chicken. Since, since it takes about 14 miles to bring my boat to a stop, All those stupid little jet skis. Oh boy, there's a wake. Whoopee. So, I have a little howitzer on the back. I'll pick those guys off. <laughs> You're going to make sport out of my boat, I'm going to make sport out of you. And because the boat's so large, it's actually a sovereign nation with its own laws. And I have diplomatic immunity when I'm on it. Yeah, I can shoot this, this jet skiers. And Lake George Patrol with their cute little boats going around us like gnats. They can't do anything. Just because you're like pirates. No. <laughs> I'm more like a king of my own sovereign nation. I think that outranks any pirate. <laughs> Make sense? All right, since that's what you're working on,